Well, welcome back to Over Family. We're glad you're here this morning. I pray you're having a great day today so far. It's early in the morning. And I trust you're all surrounded, uh, surrounding your laptops or cell phones, waiting for an encouraging word from God. And we pray that God does that through us as well. Now, we've been, if you've joined us on Wednesday night, we have been talking about Abraham's testings and trials, the, the two that he failed, the one that he passed. And now we know that Abraham kind of left there. He got chastised. He got caught. Uh, so we know that we're not going to go into that today. We're going to continue on our journey of faith with Abraham. If you'd like to see those lessons, they're on our website under DoverAssembly.com. Look on the media tab and you'll see uh, some of the services there. But we're going to catch up to him at chapter 14, where he's already out of Egypt. He's settled. Him and Lot have gone their separate ways. And now we're at chapter 14. And every time I read this particular chapter, I always wonder why it's there. It seems like a kind of a random thing that God's talking about here. But as we said before, nothing in God's word is by accident. Nothing is just indiscriminate. It's there for a purpose. And we're going to look at what that purpose is this morning. Genesis 14.1 says this, About this time war broke out in the region. King Amprahel of Babylonia, King Arioch of Eliasur, King Ketalomar of Elam, King Tidal of Golem, fought against King Bera of Sodom, King Bersha of Gomorrah, King Shanev of Adma, King Shemeber of Zeboim, and King Bela, now of Zoar. I, you know how you know this is God's word? You know, this wasn't written by man. If this were written by man, these names would be a lot easier to read. So if I mispronounce them through the remainder of this service, forgive me because they're not my natural tongue. So we're going to look at this particular instance right now, this, this event that happened to Abraham. There's a few things in this that really speak to me, that really stick out, that I hope encourages you. The first one was war surrounded Abraham. He was in the place where God told him to be. He was in Canaan. He was doing exactly what God wanted. He had been delivered out of Egypt. He kind of got back on the right path with God. You saw he had a tent. He knew he was just a sojourner there. He was only there temporary. His citizenship was in heaven. He built an altar because he had a relationship with God, and he continued to worship. You'll see many times where it says that Abraham worshiped God, or he came to the altar and worshiped God. So Abraham continued to have a great relationship with God. He was right where God wanted him, and yet all around him, war was breaking out. Even though he was doing right, he was surrounded by a lot of evil and wickedness. And we saw earlier that Sodom and Gomorrah were already classified as cities that a lot of sickness and sin and wickedness reigned. So he's a bystander in this area that war is breaking out in. And if, you're, if you've been involved in a place where there's a war, even if you're an innocent bystander, if you're just around the area, it's going to affect you at some point. Now, this is obviously an example of a spiritual battle as well. We as Christians were called to live in this world, be a part of this world, but not succumb to the temptations of the world. The Bible says we're to occupy. That means we try to affect change. We try to live our lives so that people see Jesus in us, but we're not to succumb to the way the world operates. And this, and, but given that fact, there is spiritual warfare going on all around us, and a lot of times that spiritual warfare manifests itself in actual evil that we see taking place. You see wars happening everywhere. Country against country, brother against brother, there's wars everywhere. Divorce is out there. Marriages are in trouble. Abuse is out there. Children are getting abused. Gangs and drugs and abortion and all these things that are out there. These are the wars that are going on manifested by the spiritual warfare that's happening in our life right now. And these are outward examples of spiritual things that even though we're not a part of it, it does affect us at some point. Just like it, it will affect Abraham at some point, it will call him to action. And we're going to see that a little bit later on. And a lot of times, if you're in that situation, you may be surrounded by things that are negative and it may affect you as well. Through no fault of your own, you may be a, an innocent bystander and get affected by the negative things of war that go on, goes on around you. But even though all these things are going on around us, we are not helpless in this situation. We're, not, we're innocent, but we're not helpless. God can protect us. Ephesians 6.10 says, Put on all of God's armor, 
so you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies and tricks of the devil. For we are not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against the evil rulers and authorities of this unseen world, against those mighty powers of darkness who rule this world, and against wicked spirits in their heavenly realms. 2 Corinthians 10.3, We are human, but we don't wage war with human plans and methods. We use God's mighty weapons, not mere worldly weapons, to knock down the devil's stronghold. So just as war was all around Abraham, and he eventually got caught up in it, he was called to action during that time, it affected him. We are also in this world, and there's a spiritual battle going on around us, and eventually we will be called, and we will get caught up in it as well. But we don't get caught up as people that don't have the ability to overcome it. So the second point that we see in this, and this is, this is kind of unique. I never thought about this before, but the enemy is not in unity. Now, how many of you thought that the devil and his angels and all those guys, they're all on the same page, they're all doing, you know, exactly, they're all got marching orders. That's not true. The enemy is sometimes divided against itself. So, uh, Genesis 14.3, now I'm going to read these names again to you, so excuse my uh, lack of understanding. It says, the kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela formed an alliance and mobilized their armies in the Sedum Valley. That is the Valley of the Dead Sea. For 12 years, they had all been subject to King Kedolomar. Now in the uh, 13th year, but now in the 13th year, they rebelled. One year later, Kedolomar and his allies arrived. They conquered the Raphites and Ashtoreth, Karnaim, and the Zuites and Ham and Emites in the plain of Kiriathim, and the Horites in Mount Seir as far as El Paran at the edge of the wilderness. Then they swung around to En Misphat, now called Kadesh, and destroyed the Amalekites and also the Amorites living in the Hazazon Tamar. Now, all that to say this. None of these countries were righteous. None of them were good in God's eyes. They were all wicked, and yet they were fighting each other. You would think that as, as evil countries, they would be going after the things of God. They were going after themselves. So evil doesn't, is not in unity. They are not in harmony all the time with each other. The enemy is divided. The Bible says, Jesus says, the house against itself will you know, fall. The enemy is not in unity against you. The enemy fights himself sometimes. Because of their disunity, they battled amongst themselves. A lot of times, wickedness fights itself without having anything to do with God. It's just wicked fighting wicked. Now, what's the one thing, in contrast to that, does God want of his people? Unity, right? 1 Peter 3.8 says, Finally, all of you should be of one mind, full of sympathy toward each other, loving one another with tender hearts and humble minds. 1 Corinthians 1.10, let there be real harmony so there won't be divisions in the church. I plead with you to be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Psalm 133.1, how wonderful it is, how pleasant when brothers live together in harmony. Now, there's a difference between unity and unification. Unity means you're all on the same page, serving the same God. Unification is when they're all trying to be the same person. You all try to be the same person. God calls each one of us to be individuals, but as individuals, we're all on the same page serving God. Now, the reason that unity is so powerful and so, so strong and so necessary is because there's power in agreement. There's power when there is unity. Matthew 18, 19 says, I also tell you this. If two of you agree down here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together because they are mine, again, in unity, I am there among them. There's power not only in numbers, there's power in unity of prayer. When a football team or any team is all operating with the same goal in mind, they succeed. Whenever there's disunity on the team and they argue and fight amongst themselves, they lose. Now, we have a prayer chain at, at Dover. Most of you know that. Why do we have a prayer chain? Why can't we just pray ourselves? Does God not hear individuals? He does. But there's power in numbers. There's power in unity. And so when we activate the prayer chain for an, uh, an immediate and emergency need, we now have several people praying in unison, in unity, for God to work. 
And we believe that as you pray in unity, you come against the enemy in unity and in power under the anointing of the Spirit, God moves. So there is power in unity, there's power in number. What's the opposite of that? When there's disunity, there's no agreement, we can't move forward, we can't progress. God wants unity. When the enemy doesn't have unity, and we do, we can always be victorious. The enemy is in unity, and he's in disarray, but it doesn't mean he's not powerful. We believe that he is powerful. God had allowed him to have such power. The Bible says he rules, he's the ruler of, these, of this particular age. But that means even though he's powerful, since we are unified and we have God, the Spirit of God in us and working through us, we are able to defeat the power of the enemy. Now, the third thing we see in this particular example is the pride of the people in battle. Pride goes before a fall. Genesis 14, 8 says, But now the armies of the kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela, now called Zoar, prepared for battle in the valley of the Dead Sea against King Kedolomar of Elam and the kings of Golem, Babylonia, Elisar, four kings against five. Now, again, kind of a random, little random sentence there, four against five. Again, with a purpose. So you have four kings, we assume four armies with those kings, five kings, five armies. So you would have five armies against four armies, and you would think that the five armies would have the advantage. But look at what happened in Genesis 14.10. As it happened, the valley was filled with tar pits. And as the army of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some slipped into the tar pits and the rest escaped to the mountains. The victorious invaders then plundered Sodom and Gomorrah and began their long journey home, taking all their wealth and food with them. Now, the, the five kings... This was their home turf. The other four were invaders. They were coming into Sodom. They were coming into their neck of the woods. And you would think that the people whose home turf this was would know what was outside. They would know that the tar pits were there. They would know all the terrain. They would know and how to fight. They would be ready for it. They would know how to draw the enemy in. But they had no clue. They had no clue. They didn't understand what was outside. They were too busy worrying about what was going on inside to prepare themselves for battle. The lifestyle that they were living, as we know later on, was a totally hedonistic lifestyle. And it, they did not prepare themselves for war. They thought they had pride in that they were able to be victorious because they had five allies. Now look what Ezekiel 16, 49 says. It says, Sodom's sins were pride, laziness, and gluttony, while the poor and needy suffered outside her door. She was proud and did loathsome things, things, so I wiped her out as you have seen. They had no relationship with God. They had no expectation of God intervening. They, they took no time to plan or prepare for what could possibly be. They didn't know their own terrain. They didn't know what was outside their own gates. They were proud. They believed that they'd be able to conquer anything. Pride keeps you from realizing the situations in your life. It keeps you from realizing the truth of what's going on. It keeps you from realizing your sin. It keeps you from realizing your own problems and the problems that you're causing yourself. Pride keeps you from understanding your shortcomings. If you are proudful, you think that you cannot be defeated. You can't lose. Pride comes before that fall, and it's exactly what happened to Sodom. They didn't recognize the trap that was right in front of them. The tar pits were right outside their own gates, and they didn't know they were there. And if we're not careful, if we're prideful, we are not going to see the attacks that come in our life. We're not going to recognize the situations that face us. 1 Peter 5.8 says, be careful. Watch out for the attacks of the devil, your great enemy. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for some victim to devour. Take a firm stand against him and be strong in your faith. We can't be strong in our faith. We can't really engage the enemy if we're living like everybody else. If we're living like the world and we have no relationship with God and we're, we think we're good, we think we're okay with God and things are humming along pretty good, pride comes up and now you're ill-equipped to attack, to fight off the attack of the enemy. We have to always have a strong relationship with God. We can't wait to the last minute to pray about something if, if things are coming our way. We need to be prepared. Every sports team has training camp. Every sports team has practices. Not that the practice is the game, 
but the practice prepares them for the game. Our relationship with God prepares us for whenever the enemy might want to come at us, come at us and do things either to us or around us in situations. We can't wait to the day of the game to start praying. We need to have that relationship ongoing. Number four, the thing that another instance in this example is God may call you to action even if what's happening is not affecting you. Genesis 14, 12, it says, They also captured Lot, Abram's nephew, who lived in Sodom, and took everything he owned. One of, them, one of the men who escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was camped at the oak grove belonging to Mamre the Amorite. Mamre and his relatives, Eskol and Enor, were Abraham's allies. So all this stuff was going on around him, and apparently he was not affected yet. He lived there, he lived in peace, but there's still war going on around him. As Christians, it's possible to live peacefully, allow the peace of God to come in while this stuff rages on around you, but there might be a time when God calls you out of that peaceful situation to engage what's going on in the world. Abraham could have said, you know what, Lot, Lot made his choice. I gave him the pick, of the pick of the litter here, and he chose that over there. He went to the city. He knew how bad it was. Let him go. Let him. It's his problem. I'm not going to help him. Maybe I can, you know, I, I'll just stay inside. I'm not going to get involved in this. That's somebody else's issue. I shouldn't really be involved in that. Let God handle that on his own. One commentator says this, Abraham was separated, but not isolated. He was independent but not indifferent. So he, he was ready to engage. He was ready to act for God. And the reason we know that is because he began to form alliances. He had allies. The Bible says, you know, these guys, Mamre and his relatives, were Abram's allies. And what was, what was happening here was Abraham realized the situation he was in. He realized all these towns and cities around him were wicked and at some time in the future, that might affect him. And so what he did was he began to make allies. He had people on, at his beck and call who he could ally with to go against this. Abraham did not put his head in the sand. He did not forget everything that was going around him. He realized the situation, and he planned for what possibly could happen. He didn't let it just happen to him. He was ready for it. Now, First Chronicles 12.32 and this really speaks to us, I think, in our time as well. It says, from the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives. In this verse, this is it. All these men understood the temper of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. They understood, these men of Issachar, and I believe Abraham did too. He understood where he lived. He understood all the stuff that was going on around him. And he knew what to do in preparation for that at some point. He didn't just wait for it to happen. He was ready for it, should it ever happen to him. So now they capture Lot. Abraham now has to step out. He has to actually act. In verse 14, it says, When Abraham learned that Lot had been captured, he called together the men born into his household, 318 of them in all. He chased after Kedolomar's Kedola army until he caught up with them in Dan. There he divided his men and attacked during the night from several directions. Kedolomar's army fled, but Abram chased them to Hobah, north of Damascus. So not only did he engage, he chased them. He physically went after them. Now, I read one commentary where it says he just didn't run after them and catch them as they were running. He made it to Dan before they got there. And he set up a trap for them. So when they got there, he was already prepared for them. And the same commentary says that Dan, Dan means judgment. And so this was kind of God's act of judgment on them using Abraham and his 318 men. And I wrote down on my notes here, and this is what I read from someone else, faith is no excuse for inaction. In other words, you don't sit back and say, well, let God handle it, God handle it. And there are times when we do that. But more often than not, God calls us to engage in situations. You're looking for a job. You can sit at home all day and say, well, God will handle that, God will handle that. Probably not. God's going to make you walk and knock on doors or now go online and look for a job, physically look for a job. God's not going to do it for you. 
God's not going to protect you in your car if you don't buy car insurance. You know, all these things that we prepare for, we have to do on our own, we are called to act in accordance with our faith. Now, notice it didn't automatically say either that God specifically told him to go fight, right? You know, there are times when you pray about situations, there are times when you take it to God and you really earnestly seek out, but there are also times when you see something in front of you, you need to act. The example, there's a couple of examples. In Exodus, when the Israelites complained and God told them to start marching, Exodus 14, 15 says, the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? In other words, Moses was praying to God and God says, why are you crying? Tell the Israelites to start moving. There's a time for prayer and then there's a time for action. A lot of times when we see things in front of us, it's easier for us to say, well, you know what, I'll, I'll just pray about that. When God says, no, you know what to do, do it. In fact, James 2.14 says, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose your brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, kept warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. In other words, they don't act on what they see. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, is not, if not accompanied by actions, is dead. There are times when we need to pray, and then there's times we need to step up and just act when we see it. And if we don't see it, and we don't act on it, James later says this, James 4, 17. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do, and then not do it. There are times when God calls us to action, calls us out of where we are to actually do something. Proverbs 24, 11, rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to death. Don't stand back and let them die. Don't try to avoid responsibility by saying you didn't know about it. For God knows all hearts and he sees you. He keeps watch over your soul and he knows that you knew. So Abraham knew what to do. He had a relationship with God. This was not impulsive. He had a relationship he knew what God would ask him to do. He knew he had to do the right thing, and he did it. And also said that Abraham learned. In other words, it came to his attention. If Abraham had not acted, excuse me, nothing would be done. When things come to our attention and we don't act upon the information that we have, God's purposes won't be accomplished. He could have sat back and just waited and waited it out. But once he understood, once it came to his attention, he knew he was responsible for the information he had. And when things come to our attention that need Christian intervention and we do nothing about it, we just read the verse. If you know what to do and you don't do it, you're doing it wrong. God will allow things to come to your attention and my attention for the express purposes of causing us to act. Now it says Abraham had 318 men. Again, another random verse. Why do, we, why do we know that? Well, 318 guys against f four armies. Seems like not a great odds. Reminds me of Gideon. He had 300 folks. God kept weaning the troops down until he had only 300. The point was Abraham had 318. He went against all the odds. He went against probably conventional wisdom, and he went and did what God told him to do, even though in the natural it looked like he would fail. But he knew God. He's experienced God from the time he left Haran till now. He has seen God provide every time, and every time he messed up, God brought him back, and God provided for him, and he worshiped God. He had an ongoing relationship with God. So he knew and he trusted this God to deliver him when he did the right thing. Frederick Douglass says this, and we've probably heard this quote over and over by different people, one with God makes a majority. And then one example I can think of was when Elisha and his servant were surrounded by the enemy. In 2 Kings 6, 7, 6, 16 says, don't be afraid, Elisha told him, there are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the servant's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. It's easy to look around us 
and see the four armies, and we're only 318 people, or whatever that number might be, and it seems like there's no way to overcome that. There, it's so wicked, there's so many of them, and there's so few of us that we can't possibly win. Or the situation seems so dire, and everything in the natural looks like it's going to fail, or it's gonna harm me. No matter what I do, it's not gonna work. But if you have a relationship with God, then you know that God has done this for you in the past and you can trust him for the future. Your inability, your lack of numbers, your lack of quality, your lack of fighting potential doesn't stop what God can do through you if you act. If we Christians are united in faith, we're united in prayer, united in a relationship with God, we can overcome what the human mind sees as incredible, unsurmountable odds. And the last thing that this account tells us, or at least encourages me, sometimes the victories that we see, we don't actually see. The victories that we win, we don't see the results of that. Galatians 14, 16 says, Abraham and his allies recovered everything. The goods that had been taken, Abraham's nephew Lot with his possessions, and all the women and other captives. Praise the Lord. Abraham won the battle. He overcame the odds. He beat the other, other team. He beat the other four armies. Lot's free. That's great. But we don't know what happened to the women. We have no idea what happened to the servants. We don't know if they became part of Abraham's tribe. Did they worship God? Did they go back where they came from? Did they die in the wilderness? We have no idea what happened to them. How often do we pray for someone and we intercede for them and we never know what that means, what, what that does in their life? Does it change them? Does, do they get saved? Do they know Christ? We may never know. But the one thing we do know is that Lot went right back to Sodom. Abraham delivered him from those four armies. He was in chains, probably going to be killed when he got back, if not being treated poorly. Abraham rescues him, knows that God rescued him, and what does he do? He goes right back to Sodom, right? You know, I thought about that. How many times do we help people and encourage people and pray for people and tell them what to do, and they go right back to doing what they did before, when they know what they did before kept harming them, but they keep going back? What's what Lot did? He kept going back. And if I'm Abraham, I'm thinking, that's it. I'm done rescuing this guy. This guy, he, I can't do anything about him. He keeps going back. But we're going to find out later that Abraham did it again. Sometimes you do the right thing that God calls you to do. You do everything right. You do what God calls you to do to help people, to encourage people, to bless people, to draw them to Christ. And you know what? They don't come. They go right back to where they were. Or maybe you have no idea what happens to them after that. And sometimes our attempts to really help people actually wind up blowing up in our faces. Why? Because people are going to make up their own minds. They're going to do what they want to do. But none of those excuses are, are reasons for us to not do what God tells us to do. We may think to ourselves, it's just a waste of time. I'm not wasting my breath on that. I'm not wasting one more minute on that person. I'm not doing anything because everything I've done for them in the past has not worked. But you never know, maybe this is the time. Maybe this is the time. Noah took 100 years to build the ark. Nobody except his family entered the ark. Out of all the people that saw the ark, nobody got in except his family. In 100 years. Now, we've said this sentence before. You've probably heard it before. We're called to be faithful, not necessarily successful. And a lot of times we say that because we define success as things that we can visibly see, tangible items, when a lot of times success, success is like Abraham, he did, he was successful in his mission. He rescued Lot, he rescued all his possessions, the women, the servants, he was successful. But you don't know what happened to them or you know what happened to Lot. Abraham might have called that a failure because Lot went back and we don't know about the others. But the success was simply doing what God called him to do. He left the results of his faithfulness up to God. As long as I'm faithful, God is going to take care of the results of that. 
God's going to take care of the consequences of my, of my obedience. If we define set, success as things that we can only see, that are tangible, that happen right now, that's not really faith. And, that, that, and if we only expect that, it's going to keep us from doing a lot of things. Abraham left the results up to God. He was obedient to do what he knew he should do. He acted, and he knew what he should do. He was successful in that he did God's will. And as we're going to find out later next week, he left the outcome of his obedience up to God. Now, we recognize the world that we live in today. We recognize the sinfulness that's out there, the wickedness that's out there. We pray for God's protection. We pray for God to heal the nation. We pray for, for God to work, for God to move, revival. We pray for people we know. We pray for people to come to faith in Christ. We pray for all these things. And sometimes we may be called to act in accordance with some of the things we pray for. Our job is to do all those things. Our job is to pray, to believe God, to trust God, to maybe step out and do things that God calls you to do. And our job is to leave the results of that up to God. Our job is to be faithful. Our job is to do it. God's job is to do what he wants to do through us. We may not see it. We may not experience it. We may never know. We may know when we get to heaven, but we're not going to know here. Our job is to be faithful in doing what God calls us to do here, not necessarily successful in that we see the results of our obedience. Now I'm going to close it in with this. And I've said this before. You may be a longtime member of Dover Assembly. Maybe you've been a Christian for a while and you're not a part of Dover Assembly. If that's true, we'd love to have you come back whenever we're able to get together again. But maybe you're watching this and, and you don't know Christ. And I'll tell you, through this recent experience that's out there, if you're on social media at all, you may see a lot of things going on under the name of Christianity. Now, some of you know me. and Some of you know the way I think. But the most important thing that we as believers have to do, we have to realize what our number one mission is. Our number one mission is to lead people to Jesus. And nine times out of 10, we do that by our actions, by what we do more than what we say. James Dobson says, more is caught than taught. In other words, people look at us, people watch us. If you're watching me, I'm hoping you see Jesus in me. If you're not, if you don't see that, forgive me. I want to express Jesus to you. And this is the time when all this is going on in the world, when people are so uncertain, you need something to hold on to. You need something to be certain of. And the one thing you can be certain of is your relationship with God. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow, not next week, but today. And when you give your life to Christ, it happens in a moment. You can be right with God in a moment, have that relationship with God in a moment. And if you're like me, when you walked away praying that prayer, the light bulb went off in your head and you understood. Because up to that point, I didn't understand. But God, man, he turned the light on in me. And I understood. Now, we don't do everything perfect as Christians, but our goal is to lead people to Jesus so that imperfect people know that there's a perfect God out there to whom they can have a relationship and, and whom can bless them and keep them and give them assurance and difficult times like today. So if you're one of those people that, that have really never given your life to Christ, you're not really sure about this, or you've seen things that nah, they may turn you off, don't look at people. Look at God. I'll give you a good example of why I say that. If you've ever been in a, in a restaurant or a department store or any kind of retail outlet, and one person one waiter or one sales clerk is really rude to you, really mean to you, for whatever reason. You walk out, what do you say? Do you classify the entire restaurant or store as being rude or mean? Or do you say, well, that one person was rude or mean to you? The next time you may come, you may see 20 people that are really nice to you. 
You can't judge God's people totally on what God, on what people act like, because we're imperfect. Our job is to lead you to Jesus, and hopefully you see Jesus in us. So if you see, if you want what we've got, we're trying to share with people, let them know that there's a God who cares about them, that loves them, and wants a relationship with them as a parent. And if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about, how much you love your kids. The Bible refers God to God constantly as our Father. We're God's kids, and He wants that relationship with you. So if you want that, I'm going to pray with you right now. I want you just to bow your heads where you are. This is the time that God is speaking to you. Don't overthink it. The Bible says that if you're thinking about God, it's because God is making you think about Him. He's drawing you in. The Bible says no one comes to God unless the Spirit of God draws Him, the Father draws Him. So if you're thinking about God, it's because God has put that that seed in your mind to think about Him, to draw you in. But ultimately, the choice is yours. The Bible says that God stands at the door of your heart and He knocks. He's not going to open the door. He's not going to kick it down. He wants you to open the door and invite Him into your life. If that's you. I want you to pray this prayer. Father, thank you for dying for me for paying the penalty for my sins. In my own life, I know I'm not worthy. I know I've sinned. And I know that my sin keeps me from you. But your sacrifice paid my debt. So that my sins, because I believe that, are forgiven. They're wiped clean. And now I have a relationship with you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, please get in contact with us. We want nothing more than to encourage you in your walk, to let you draw closer to God, to experience what most of us have already experienced the joy, the excitement that comes from knowing Christ. All the other things are benefits of that. But the innermost thing that we desire for people is to let you know Jesus. And we pray that you see Jesus in what we do in Dover Assembly. Please, if you have any information or you want any information, contact me, uh, doverassembly.com. You can drop an email to me, uh, doverassembly at Gmail. Call me at the, on the phone. Anything you want to do, we will be glad to give you some information. Thank you again for joining us this Sunday morning, and we will see you next Sunday, or actually next Wednesday, as we start a new series. And then Sunday again after that, as we continue with Abraham. God bless you. Have a tremendous week. We'll see you then.